Hola, hola. Hi, 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 hi. Hey. Estamos en. Estamos. Estamos en. En Sonoma County. Y estamos en un tour de Champagne. Así que. Ahorita que terminemos de un video que nos van a enseñar, saldremos nuevamente a seguir grabando. There was gunfire. The police arrested Francis, saying he had pulled the trigger. He was sentenced to 17 years in Dalaborka prison. This formidable penitentiary had an distinctive stone tower that Francis would never forget. After two years of confinement, Francis was able to escape with the help of his mother. He spent two years in that prison. And finally, I guess, mother came up with the idea that I'm going to get my son out of prison. And as I said, she came in with civilian clothes in, hidden underneath her clothes, and he put them on and walked out to prison very casually. Francis fled Prague and eventually arrived in Holland, where he learned cigar making. In a short period, Francis was able to save enough money to purchase a transatlantic ticket. His destination? New York City. Muy bien. Estoy grabando. As their business grew, Francis and his brothers realized they needed reliable year-round transportation for their timber. The Carbells would not have been able to ship uh, any major heavy product like uh, wood. Uh, to San Francisco and points uh, around the world uh, without um, confining that transportation to the summertime and also would have been very, very expensive to be hauled by wagon uh, and ox cart or whatever else they had available. After the railroad arrived here in 1876, they basically had direct line access to San Francisco uh, by railroad and ferry boat and that's any point in the world by shipping. The Corbells financed and built their first railway to connect the middle with the world beyond. In 1906, a powerful earthquake hit San Francisco. The shockwaves leveled buildings in Santa Rosa and reached all the way to the winery. But the winery's sturdy design and construction absorbed the impact of the earthquake without sustaining even a cracked window pane. The Brandy Tower was not as fortunate. It was severely damaged and iron bands still present today were installed for support. When Prohibition began in 1919 and alcoholic beverages were banned, the Corbell brothers reacted by reducing their inventory. During this period, Corbell was permitted to make and sell a limited amount of wine and brandy for altar and medicinal purposes. <laughs> None of the founding Corbell brothers could have survived the reveal of Prohibition in 1933. But the winery did, and a case of Corbell was delivered to the White House to mark the end of Prohibition. Yay. In the early 1950s, the remaining members of the Corbell family sold the winery to Adolf Eck, a third generation winemaker. Adolf possessed a profound respect for the history of the winery and the method Chabanois tradition. Adolf brought a new vision to the winery. He introduced a unique yeast culture into the secondary fermentation process. Today, Corbell uses descendants of this same culture to make its California champagne. Gary Heck has led Corbell through its most accelerated growth and expansion, extending the product line with many styles of California champagne. Corbell maintains its distinction as America's top-selling champagne. Corbell has been a symbol of American celebration since 1882. From premier sporting events to historic occasions, Corbell has been for life's toasts. What began as an American dream has, over time, become 
and a very good time. Okay, so we must Vamos a ver qué más. ¿Qué más vamos acá? Oh, pues aquí fue lo que grabé hace un momento. Also was an amateur photographer, so part of his negotiation with the Corbell family is uh, he would come, but he wanted to have a dark room waiting upon his arrival. So fortunately, the Corbells agreed to that, and because of that, we have a lot of these great historic photos that you see today, uh, hmm. including this is one where you can actually see the Champagne Tower. I mean, the Brandy Tower, uh, separate from the <laughs> behind the Ivy. What's there? Uh, that's a blueprint that shows how the still fits up inside the or fit up inside the tower. And then uh, here's a picture. We're in the right in the middle there. There's that brick building. We're inside that brick building. This is, uh, as I mentioned, when there was an orchard across the road, but you can still see those big redwood stumps there. And then in this photo, uh, we have the vines in, but there's still the redwood stumps. Again, we're in that red building. Now, another thing that's unusual about this photo is we had a light dusting of snow that day. And I did mention we get the coastal influence, uh, the cooling influence. Doesn't usually get that cool. That was kind of a big deal. I know uh, often we have visitors from all over the U.S., so if you're from the East Coast or the Midwest, you're probably like, snow? What snow? <laughs> but in Sonoma County, that's a really big deal. I'm mean, particularly out here on the coast, so uh, took a picture of that. And then... Um, going to talk about the logging industry. Uh, this is, uh, I remember I pointed to the parking lot and said there used to be a sawmill there. There's a picture of the sawmill. That white house that's right there, it's uh, still in existence. It's just above the hill over here. There's a whole garden tour that goes around the outside of the house. Uh, these are some of the crazy big saws that they use to take down those logs. Damn. Uh, and here's some pictures of the logs on their sides. You see how big those trees really are. Uh, I know I sound like I'm a spokesperson for Armstrong Woods, but it's such a cool place. And they have <laughs> our most popular, um, probably the root or the they pull dirt. Si no vamos de camino donde tienen los barriles. Damn. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. This is no longer used for production. We do most of our wine fermenting outside of the tanks, but these barrels served us for a long time, so we definitely keep them around. Uh, these casks are over 120 years old. Uh, they're made of New England white oak. As you can see, really big casks, not quite so big doorways. They were actually built on the spot. We brought the wood in, we brought the coopers, the, those are the barrel makers up from San Francisco. They made the casks right here. Uh, the ones that you walk by just the way in the more normal sized ones, those are still used in production. I think those have the cream sherry in them now. Sí, 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 porque todavía no está. Déjame contribuir. Right there. So then when you uh, go ahead and pop the cap, 
there's enough pressure here in the bottle that's going to help push out that little chunk of ice, taking the little yeast that was on top with it. So now you've gotten the residue out of the bottle, but there's two things that you need to address. So you did, uh, as part of the freezing process, you did uh, extract some of the wines. So you need to refill the bottle. And then the other thing is that when the yeast was in there uh, eating up all the sugar to make the bubbles, uh, there's now no sugar left. So for even for those of you who like a really dry champagne product, it's so dry it wouldn't be in your taste. So then the next thing is, uh, again, another French term called the dosage, where you're adding a little bit of additional wine just to fill up the bottle, and you're also adding just a little bit of sugar. So um, the machine we use today is... Essentially, it does the same thing. It's silver, it's shiny, it's automatic, but it basically does the same thing. Uh, you have the little additional amount of wine that has the sugar solution in it, and you just put a little squirt into each bottle, uh, and then it fills it up. It's made it a little bit sweeter, and then you're ready to put the cork on. Uh, we're gonna, we make some very dry champagnes that are 0.75% dosage. Wait, it's fine. We also make... Um, uh, we make a uh, Swedish champagne. We make is six percent dosage. We will taste one of. Uh, we'll taste both ends of those at our tasting. Uh, the next phase uh, is putting the cork in, and that was done with this. Um, this is, the, of course, the old-fashioned way of doing it. We all do it by machine now. But this is a thirty-pound weight, so you're trying to. You have to have a lot of pressure to get this cork into uh, not that big of an opening. So you really need a lot of pressure to make that happen. As with the riddling, I don't think that this was that desirable of a job, and I'm kind of basing it on the slightly gross expression of our working guy. Um, he's just the, focused. He's focused, yes. Yeah. Like, I'm working on Labor Day. They haven't invented, I don't know. When did they invent Labor Day? There's a pop quiz. Hmm. Who knows? I have no idea. Um, anyway. Uh, so then the next phase, I usually have a little demo here. Let me get it. Uh, so after the cork is in, uh, you do want to make sure that cork stays nice and stable. So uh, in the champagne world, you put on this little piece of metal. This is Some people call this a cage. Sometimes it's called a muzzle. And it just fits over the cork. You uh, close it with six half twists, which is champagne tradition all over the world. And then that just really makes sure that cork stays secure. So uh, when you go home, if you're opening champagne at home, once you take the foil off, it's still very secure, but once you start undoing this, you really should keep your thumb on it so it doesn't go flying off unexpectedly. So let's step around the corner. I have a few more historic things to show you, and then we're going to go do our tasting. Oh, and a very large champagne glass. Whoa. So these things were, uh, they were both produced to commemorate special occasions. The glass was made uh, on the occasion of the that was a big party that San Francisco threw in 1915 to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal. In the movie, they talk about how the Corbell brothers wanted to come to California, but they basically kind of missed the gold rush because it took them so long to get here. So uh, once the Panama Canal was completed, it was actually a really big deal for San Francisco, so they responded by throwing a big party. And then uh, the bottle was made for another special occasion. The Millennium, which, you remember when it was like the Millennium was so far in the future, it going to be such a big deal, and now it's like so a rear view mirror. Anyway, it was a big deal at the time. Corbell was chosen as, uh, at Times Square. I'm still trying to find some YouTube video to see how they did that, because it's uh, a very large bottle. The bottle weighs 360 pounds. The cork itself weighs eight pounds. You know the traditional thing that people say about opening champagne? They say turn the bottle, not the cork. I'm not quite sure how you turn a 360 pound bottle or how you hold on to a uh, eight pound cork. Uh, but once you do manage to get it open, you have 120 liters of champagne in there. So, Whoa. Uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty, nothing says party like 120 liters of champagne. So, uh, this uh, those are very selection that they have 16 different champagnes, so uh, a brandy, on our website, we can ship to you and depending uh, what state five so, uh, red, uh, unspotted wines, we have a lot of two white things, and three reds. Let's yes. go! Let's do a tasting now. Well, here we go the video.
Ciao.